Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. This is, this is the first time I've presented this work to anthropologists, or a group that might include anthropologists. <laughs> a little anxious, but... Uh, <clears throat> um, there is this idea that uh, we sleep a lot less than we used to, it, it seems to make sense because we know that light is arousing and that it needs to be dark if you sleep. And uh, uh, Thomas Edison is kind of a, a culprit in this because he bragged about how little he slept because he had electric lights, presumably. And the idea is that with the advent, and not so much of electric lights, but TV, uh, the internet, and so on, that uh, the amount of sleep has decreased greatly, and at the same time, certain diseases, especially obesity, but also ADHD and diabetes, have greatly increased. And people put these two things together, the very real increase in these diseases and the uh, uh, assumed decrease in sleep time. So here you see a claim uh, that the average American sleeps three hours less per night, some you know, with a little qualification, some estimates suggest. Um, and this is from, actually, from the laboratory of uh, the, uh, one of the people who edits this human health magazine that you just got. <clears throat> so the question is, uh, is that true, which I must confess was part of my motivation. But the more general motivation is, how do people sleep when they're born and raised in an environment that differs from our own. In other words, what is the effect of, of our environment, of electric lights, and many other things on sleep? Is, is there a pattern of sleep that, that was uh, pretty widespread among humans uh, that's vanished? And, and also, what is the duration of sleep? So. Um, <clears throat> It's sort of an interesting story, but it's not very substantive how I got together with all these people. But these are the, the co-authors on, on the paper. Uh, and I, I suspected when I showed this that many of you would know some of the people in the top two lines, whereas I actually have never met any of them except for Gandhi. Uh, but I worked with them, uh, and, which is not to say they didn't contribute. But I, this is all done uh, by email. And, and, and Brooke confirmed that that's true. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the first group we studied are the Hadza in Tanzania. Uh, and this is a, a book that Frank Marlowe wrote uh, summarizing his work. And uh, I think I was working essentially with his students. They have no electricity. No guns, no coffee or energy drinks, no agriculture, no cattle, no uh, animals. Uh, they really don't have uh, permanent structures. They migrate every two to three months uh, in a uh, circumscribed area around Lake Ayasi. Uh, so uh, there's, there's virtually no obesity in this group. And uh, actually, the way I, I got in contact with the anthropologist that I ultimately work with uh, was Herman Ponser wrote an op-ed in the New York Times after he published his paper saying that, that uh, they don't have a higher daily energy expenditure. It, it's not like we used to expend more energy than we do now. His conclusion is that metabolic rate kind of adjusts. Um, they sleep on animal skins under the stars. So you can't get uh, closer to conditions removed from our environment. Um, there was a, a paper in Nature, I think two years ago, that said that the hunter-gatherer, the, the, um, the San group of, that we worked with has the most diverse human genome, the idea being that family groups migrated out of Africa with a limited subset of genes, and they've proliferated into all the uh, various ethnic groups, but that the individual San are as different from each other as, as uh, different racial groups in our society. I find this hard to believe, but that is the claim in the paper. 
and uh, the, the sun were, this image is supposedly of the sun on the Voyager 1 spacecraft that's, you know, that Carl Sagan con constructed, this, this record that Carl Sagan con constructed to indicate uh, humans. Uh, and w the third group we worked with were, were the uh, Chimani in San Borja, Bolivia. And they do have uh, permanent structures. Um, so these are the uh, three groups. And the reason that I, I didn't want to even publish preliminary data on one group is because I assumed that if the data was not what people expected, they would attribute it to this group. And so we have three groups that, as it turns out, show very much the same uh, sleep pattern, although we've already been criticized by saying that these groups are all marginalized, and I don't know where the non-marginalized groups are, <clears throat> that they're not representative. So this is an act to watch. Uh, this is an act to watch two. Uh, it's, it's like a watch. It has an event marker, which we essentially don't use. It has a light sensor, and I'll, I'll show you what we get from that. So it can sense the ambient light level. And um, most importantly, it has an accelerometer. And uh, it's sort of like a Fitbit. Uh, the difference being that the, the data from ActiWatch has been extensively validated. That is, uh, people uh, wore Act watches while they were having uh, full EEG recordings, which is the gold standard. And there's a, a rather substantial literature. So, you know, you really wouldn't want to use a different kind of device because uh, it could be criticized on that basis. But there are, uh, the Act watch isn't the only device that's been validated, but it's the one that's been used most extensively. So uh, this is the group that I worked with in Namibia. And a couple of people in my prior presentations have asked me, uh, these, these weren't anthropologists but sleep researchers, but you know, weren't these people kind of freaked out that they had this thing on their wrist? Uh, but you, you can see that uh, more than half of the subjects here have other jewelry on their same wrist. So it's, it's not that unusual, and, and really they're not that uh, you know, concerned about what you're doing. And I did, I did learn. Uh, that I shouldn't smile in these pictures. Uh, <laughs> it's a lesson I should have gotten from our lab group pictures that we take because none of my postdocs smile. This is kind of a, you gotta be American born th to have to smile in a picture. <clears throat> so this is the basic finding. Um, this is each uh, group of four lines is from one subject. So this is showing data from four subjects, one of them at two different times of the year. And what you see is, uh, first of all, uh, so the, the red line indicates one minute epochs in which there was activity seen on the accelerometer. The black line indicates the amount of activity during the one minute epochs. The yellow line indicates the intensity of the light recorded by the act watch. The light blue indicates a, a rest period. And now we're using the algorithm of the act watch to differentiate, differentiate between rest and sleep. And the uh, darker blue indicates the scored sleep periods. The red uh, spots in here indicate activity within the sleep period. So everyone is active during the sleep period. And the conventional way of scoring this is to subtract wake after sleep onset, WASO, for the in-group, uh, and, and get a sleep duration. But you can also calculate sleep period, which would be the time from onset to offset, which more corresponds to what we think we sleep. In other words, if you go to sleep at 11, get up at 7, and someone asks you how long you sleep, you'll say 8 hours. But if you're wearing an actor watch, it would actually turn out to be about 7 hours of sleep. And, and, uh, uh, some movement during sleep. As it turns out, uh, this makes no difference in the comparisons, that the wake after sleep onset in these groups is not different from uh, other published studies in, in the United States and elsewhere. So you can see uh, one, one very striking thing is 
the time of sleep onset is quite variable. Uh, and in every subject that we studied for more than a week, it was significantly more variable. Onset uh, times were significantly more variable than offset times. Basically, uh, all, all the people in the group are getting up at about the same time, even if they're not in the same location, whereas there, uh, there's a lot of variation from day to day. Much more, I think, than, than in our population, maybe not if you, if you count weekends, uh, but a lot of variation in sleep onset time. Um, another thing that's obvious here, this is sunset. You can see the light going to zero. And uh, the sleep onset is several hours after sunset. None of the subjects that we studied, we have 94 subjects now, none of the su subjects that we studied goes to sleep at sunset or within an hour of sunset. The sleep is in the last part of the night. And also, they generally are, are waking up before sunrise. So th the idea that sleep is entirely regulated by light uh, does not explain uh, their, their sleep pattern. I don't deny, of course, that light has a potent effect on sleep. So you see this variability in onset, lack of variability in offset. And <clears throat> in this subject, uh, recorded in uh, midsummer and here in late fall, the same individual for four days, you see um, there's a big offset in uh, when the sleep period is, uh, but, but perhaps of greater significance is that the sleep duration is much greater in this late fall sample than it is in the summer. And we saw this in two groups. It's highly significant. It occurs in every subject. Uh, in this case, we recorded the same subjects in summer and winter. In the group in Bolivia, we recorded different subjects in summer and winter. In both groups, the winter sleep was about uh, an hour more than the summer meet sleep, about 53, 55 minutes. And this is something that does not occur in, the, in our culture in the United States. And there have been many studies in the United States and Europe over the years that have argued about whether there's any difference between summer and winter. The most uh, definitive was published just a year ago in Berlin, where they found, I think, an 18-minute difference. In order for that to be significant, they had to record from 1,000 subjects, uh, an 18-minute difference with uh, winter uh, greater than uh, summer. But then there have been a lot of negative findings. But it, but it appears that, that, that in an environment where, where uh, you're living with natural light and natural temperature variations, you have this huge uh, summer-winter difference. And so this shows uh, the San group. Uh, here we're looking at the same people uh, from winter to summer. And here you have the um, Chimani. And you, you see about the same change in duration. So a big effect of season. And the, uh, the sleep duration, that's this shorter number of how much actual sleep you get, uh, ranged from 5.9 to 7.1 hours across these groups. The sleep period, that is time from onset to offset, ranged from 6.9 hours in the summer to 8.5 hours in the winter. Uh, and th these are the different groups uh, studied at different times of the year. So um, it actually turns out that rather than sleeping three hours more than we sleep, uh, they, they sleep, the sleep duration is at the low end. Certainly in the summer, it's the lowest that's ever been reported. But even if you average the summer and winter, the durations are at the low end of what's been report, reported in our society. My point is not that they sleep less than we do, but that they clearly don't sleep more than we do. And that's, and that's quite obvious. I can show you uh, uh, some, some comparison groups that we looked at. And the, uh, the two summer periods are, are the lowest of any group that's been reported. So the next thing I usually hear when I present this data was, is uh, 
you know, aren't they, uh, don't they have a shorter lifespan? Indeed, if you Google these groups, you usually see that their lifespan is, uh, you know, the average lifespan is 37 or 38. Maybe I don't need to say this to a group of anthropologists, but of course, lifespan uh, mostly reflects infant mortality. And, uh, you know, the, these groups on average have six kids and their population is constant, so many of them die. They, um, they certainly are subject to uh, malaria. Every time I go, I gotta take my pills. And uh, yellow fever in Bolivia. And uh, there's um, variable rates of uh, childhood immunization. Uh, Marlowe in his book talks about uh, kids dying from, uh, from uh, polio and from measles. Um, I think that's changing, but certainly uh, until recently there hasn't been uh, much immunization, kind of like in Santa Monica. <clears throat> So one of the surprising things we saw right away that was certainly unexpected was that the light level, uh, so here we're plotting now, we've taken the raw data and averaged it. We're plotting the light exposure of these groups. Uh, the Hadza, who live uh, quite near the equator, so a summer-winter comparison isn't very meaningful, although there are you know, uh, weather changes. Uh, the sun in the summer and the sun in the winter. So in all cases, the light exposure actually goes down at midday, not up. And this is, this is interesting in terms of what we know about uh, effects of morning light. Uh, one of the standard treatments for depression is bright light. You know, people are literally told to sleep in front of a bank of, uh, and, and sit in front of a bank of fluorescent lights in the morning, and this will uh, tend to have an antidepressant effect, and, it, and no one's ever really explained why this is true. They can, you can say it might reset the circadian rhythm, or whatever. But but thinking that this is the pattern uh, that our ancestors may have had uh, suggests that in in our society we don't have this. We don't have the morning uh, intense morning light exposure, uh, and of course the you know I, I'll show you a picture. The reason the light exposure goes down at midday is they're getting out of the sun, which you know, sort of seems obvious. Uh, but I, I, I certainly wouldn't have thought this before I had this, this data. And I think um, just waiting uh, to, to get here this morning, uh, thinking that you know, like in the 1800s, the thing to do was to stay out of the sun. It was considered unhealthy to be in the sun. And uh, you know, there was maybe a kind of a racist implication there that you don't, you don't want to get too tan. And then, you know, in the 60s and 70s, all of a sudden, you know, the sun was necessary for vitamin D, so everybody wanted to get, get a lot of sun exposure. And only people who were wimps and unhealthy didn't get sun exposure. And of course, this led to the uh, uh, increased incidence of skin cancer. And so now we have sunblock. And I don't know whether people are spending more time in the sun or not. But, but if, if the justification is going to be uh, you know, that's the way a hunter-gatherer would behave, then that's not correct. They quite consistently um, uh, have decreased light exposure at midday. Uh, an another idea is that uh, at midday is when you're supposed to nap, and that hunter-gatherers used to nap at, at midday. We don't see that at all. What we see is they get out of the sun. Uh, but, but napping is actually quite rare, both in the summer and the winter, a little bit more in the summer, uh, but still 22% uh, of the days there's napping, so you know, a little bit more than one out of five days. It's not a daily occurrence, even though uh, having experienced the, the, the summer in the sun myself, it's hot, uh, but, but uh, there isn't napping uh, during the day, and there isn't a, a period of waking, wakening in midnight, which is another uh, sort of uh, truism that gets passed down that the normal pattern is to wake up at night and spend an hour in quiet waking activity and then go back to sleep. We didn't see that in any of these groups. So the maximum light exposure is about 9 a.m. Um, 
There's no regular decrease of activity at noon, and you can see this in the raw activity scores. But more importantly, you can see it if you score for sleep, the usual characteristics of sleep, uh, using the, uh, uh, the ActaWatch software. Jerry, can I ask a, a yep. question? Yep. Does, does the watch distinguish between um, activity that simply involves digital manipulation and, and gross motor movement? Can it tell how active the person is in terms of... Well, you can, you can tell the intensity of the movement, uh, for sure. Um, you know, I think the, the, the limitation is, uh, you know, if you're not moving, you can be awake. But if you are moving, you can't be asleep unless you have some neurological disorder. So uh, for our purposes, this is good because... Um, the the am ambiguity is that they may actually sleep less than we're reporting. Uh, you know, you really, um, well, we continue to work with these individuals and, and to get additional information. Uh, so here, this is, uh, in the winter, you have naps on less than 7% of days. That is, we see periods of inactivity that might be naps or might not be naps. We don't know. But, but uh, it couldn't be more than 7%, and in the summer on 22% of the days. And this is based on a total of 690 days of observation. So we got a lot of data on these uh, individuals in, in two of the three groups, and no evidence for a period of nighttime activity. So this is, you know, after I got the data, I, I went and looked back at my pictures, and not surprisingly, this is, this is what they're doing at noon. They're, they're getting in the shade uh, like we do, uh, except when we force ourselves to disobey our, our uh, instincts. So here we plotted um, the onset on the left and the offset of sleep. The light bar indicates uh, the start, sunrise, and, and the, uh, at the end of sunrise, uh, sunset is here. And here you can see the distribution of sleep onset and offset times. And uh, the first thing, as I showed you in, in the raw data figure, is that uh, onset is much more variable than sleep offset. So you see that the curve is much wider at onset than it is at offset, where it's uh, pretty sharp. With many uh, of the uh, offsets occurring while it's still dark, this is an example of, of a period in which they, the peak uh, awakening time was actually after sunrise. Uh, but that was not typical. But it stimulated a further uh, observation. But you see here in the winter, the, the peak time and about half of the, uh, the wake onsets are occurring while it's still dark. And you know, the, the dusk at these latitudes lasts about uh, 30, 40 minutes. Um, so uh, many of these awakenings are occurring after. Uh, be, you know, before sunrise, and, and uh, more obviously, the sleep onset is almost never occurring at sunset. It's just not. <clears throat> so the time of sleep onset is very variable. Wake onset is less variable. Uh, the time of wake onset is later in the summer, after sunrise in the sun, even though the period of waking is longer. So they're actually, even though they're waking up uh, later relative to sunrise, the, uh, the mean duration of the wake period has increased. <clears throat> and this is because they're going to sleep much later. So the longer waking period is a result of later sleep onset, not earlier sleep offset. But light isn't the uh, sole determinant of awakening time, even though this has been the main um, focus of research. I think mostly because it's very easy to manipulate light. You know, you can put bright light in front of people. You can put them in the dark 
uh, very easily. And there's been a lot of uh, work on this, and there's no question that bright light, particularly blue light, uh, delays sleep onset. It's blue light because there's a system in the retina called the melanopsin system, which projects the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is blue light sensitive. So this is a very well established uh, path. Um, so sometimes you may see advice to avoid blue light. If you fly anywhere, you can see that the planes, uh, most of the planes that change lighting at night do it in just the wrong way. They, they, they dim the white light and they make the blue light, which is kind of funny. <clears throat> so the sun subject awakened on average one hour after sunrise in the sun summer. The Chimani awakened, so this is the group in Bolivia, waking, awakened 1.4 hours before sunrise in the summer. Uh, and this is so a 2.4 hour difference in awakening time, even though at these two dates, and this was something we hadn't planned either, but we were collecting data at both sites, uh, the, the, the difference is certainly not difference due to the difference in light level. Because in, in, the, uh, in the San, we, we had 13 hour days, and in the uh, Chimani, we had 12.9 hour days at this point of observation. So there's so perfect comparison groups, only a, a six minute difference in the length of the day, and yet there's a 2.4 hour difference in the awakening times. <clears throat> so in the Hadza, which is the first group we examined, the sleep onset was 3.4 hours after sunset, and sleep offset was on average one hour before sunrise. And clearly the sleep period is not centered in the dark period. That's crystal clear because of this three uh, hour or more delay. And it occurred to me that it might be related to temperature. Uh, because again, naively, you don't think about this. But even in the Hadzu or at the equator, it gets cold at night. Um, and so uh, fortunately, the, the Serengeti weather station is pretty close to where the Hadza are. And you know you can download this information from the internet and, and see what the temperatures are. And this is what I got. And you can see that uh, they're sleeping during a period where temperature is decreasing. And basically, the sleep period coincides with the lowest uh, period of nighttime temperature, with, with a period of lowest nighttime temperature. And this is something that actually has never been looked at. I mean, one of the first things that people did when they're studying sleep in animals, and even in humans, is to try and eliminate temperature because you want to decrease variability. So this guy, Nathaniel Kleitman, who was involved in the discovery of REM sleep, uh, did this famous experiment where he took his uh, you know, graduate student or postdoc into, a, into Mammoth Cave in Tennessee, where it's a constant temperature. And they stayed there for 40 days and, and try to tried out different sleep cycles and, you know, and different light cycles, so there's, there's no light and no temperature. And that's kind of the way we do all our studies. You know, we put them in labs that are temperature controlled. If you're working with animal, that's a legal requirement. Uh, and uh, if you're working with humans, it's, you know, people aren't going to sleep in, in, in uh, a room that's uh, 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So, so this, this variable has been virtually ignored but uh, to me, it makes a lot more sense that, that, uh, you know, that what we're seeing, the, the, the sleep is during the period of coldest uh, temperature. And of course, light is related to temperature. In the dark is when it gets cold. So the, the light relationship that is so well established and is real uh, may actually be secondary to the temperature uh, relation, which, which has some obvious adaptive value. In other words, if, if you want to be active at night, it's going to be metabolically more costly because it will be colder. And, and uh, you know, uh, humans don't have fur. <clears throat> so I wanted to investigate this further. And I use these devices called eye buttons. And this gives you an idea of how big they are. You can uh, put them on your finger and just tape it on. And it's a, a self-contained device that will measure finger temperature every four minutes. And it'll go for about five days before it fills up. So you can get finger temperature. Now, the reason you want finger temperature 
or the reason I wanted finger temperature, is because uh, that uh, measures uh, vasoconstriction, vasodilation, in other words, how cold you are, um, and uh, core temperature is a little bit more difficult to get. Um, so here we, we use the, act, the uh, eye buttons now to measure temperature. So this is, this is not the one that's on the subject. This is the environmental temperature. You see it's very much like, uh, so, so this is now in Namibia, but the, the curve is very much like uh, the cruder curve that we, we got from the Serengeti weather station for the Hadza. And the black, again, is night, white is day, and you can see the, the temperature uh, recorded every four minutes at the site of the subjects. And here you can see the sleep period in blue. And you can see the sleep is onset is occurring during the fall in temperature. And awakening is occurring when the temperature stops falling. Now, many of you may be aware, or you, you've discovered this yourself, that it's easier to sleep at night if you turn the thermostat down. That's sort of standard advice in uh, sleep disorder centers. You know, it should be a little colder. But the actual natural environment is not just a lower temperature, but it's a falling temperature. And there are th uh, thermostats now that, that can set a, a temperature ramp like this. And I, I wonder if that might be a, a more healthy way uh, to sleep. I mean, obviously, none of the uh, features of sleep in these hunter-gatherers is necessarily something you want to imitate, but it does give an indication of uh, you know, how sleep is in, in the natural environment, in the environment in which humans evolved. And uh, certainly reason that there's uh, millions of years of selection in, in uh, animals leading up to humans and hundreds of thousands of years in, in, in to, uh, to sort of get to, to modern humans. It was all done in this environment. And uh, um, this, this may very well have some uh, significance. The, other, the thing we see with the finger temperature is indicated by these red arrows. And the finger temperature is in blue. The abdominal temperature is in red. And that's fairly constant. Um, but what you see in the finger temperature is that it drops precipitously at about the time of awakening. In other words, their hands are cold. And I think anyone who's ever camped in the Sierras or actually many other places knows the experience of waking up with freezing cold hands. But this is true even in the summer, that the, there is this vasoconstriction at wake onset, which means they're not vasoconstricted during sleep. And so you can see this, this is fairly consistent. There are some vasoconstrictions during the day. I assume this may be when they're cooking, put their hands in water, and so on. But it occurs both, both in the summer and in the winter. So sleep occurs during a fall and ambient temperature. Awakening occurs at the temperature in nadir. There's vasoconstriction consistent with awakening. And you know, sort of one of the almost definitions of what we call civilization is that we eliminate this temperature variation from our life. And, and the implications of this uh, are, are really unknown. And you know, so, so some people say, well, should I, you know, should I f have the temperature fall this far? Uh, you know, might that be good? I, I think, and I always say, don't do that on my say-so, because uh, one, of, one of the major differences is that's the environment in which these kids are born. They've spent their whole life there. And the adult, when they reach, reach adulthood, which you know, we're just looking at adults here, they've lived in this environment for their, their entire life. And we know uh, that uh, thermoregulatory adaptations occur over a period of time. So, you know, we, we can't simply dive into this environment. So we did uh, seven or 28 day recordings, um, 94 subjects, uh, 1165 days of recording at all, the, the total at all three sites. 
in general, all three groups have the same sleep parameters, about the same sleep duration, about the same uh, delay of sleep onset uh, relative to sunset, which is to say none of them went to sleep at sunset. Uh, no sleep onset at sunset, even in the absence of electric light. Um, the sleep duration is the same or, or less than that of minute, that's been reported in, in modern, I guess, modern in quotes cultures. Um, so, uh, you know, there was a, a small variation between these groups, but, but uh, there are many uh, groups that have been studied uh, many different control groups and experimental groups uh, with uh, thousands of subjects that have been studied with various act to watch studies all uh, in the United States or Japan or uh, uh, Europe. And uh, <clears throat> you, can, you can compare all the parameters. You can compare wake after sleep onset, which is not different in these groups. You might think that there would be more wake after sleep onset. After all, they're not they're not uh, sleeping in, in uh, comfortable beds. One of the people who participated in this uh, thing at Pauley Pavilion last Thursday was uh, the, the CEO of the sleep number company. And uh, you know, the implication there being that if you have problems sleeping, you gotta buy one of their beds. And I think, uh, so these people had the same quality of sleep, uh, literally sleeping on the ground. <clears throat> There's very little napping and so uh, again, this, this current push to improve people's sleep, which I'm all for, although it's not that we have less sleep duration, um, is uh, there is several groups, several people, I should say, advocating daily napping. The, the best evidence is that daily napping disrupts nighttime sleep. So if you're happy with that arrangement, then it's fine. I think there are individual differences. But if your complaint is insomnia and you go to sleep center, they'll, they'll ask you, you know, do you drink caffeine late in the day? Do you drink alcohol late in the day? And do you nap? And if you nap and you have problems sleeping at night, you should stop napping. That's the universal uh, uh, instruction. And of course, a, a lot of this napping is based on the idea that that's the natural pattern that we you know, th that in our natural environment, we'd all be napping, we'd have a siesta. We don't see that. These, these uh, groups are in hot environments, certainly during the summer, in the San and the Chimani and the Hadza right at the equator. They don't nap. It's not, uh, as, as far as this would indicate, a natural f uh, pattern in, in human sleep. And Perhaps of more relevance <clears throat> is that insomnia is virtually non-existent in these populations. If you ask them and you first have to explain to them what insomnia is, because it's kind of a, an alien concept, and say, do you have d trouble getting to sleep at night? Uh, do you wake up in the middle of the night? Um, if you ask that of uh, a cross-section of uh, I don't know about college students, since they tend to sleep deprive themselves, they, they probably don't have problems getting to sleep. But, but in the general U.S. population, it's been estimated that 20 to 30 percent have chronic insomnia. Uh, these groups have virtually no insomnia, if you, if you ask them the question. And also, if you look at the records, you can see that they're not long periods of night. Uh, they're, they're not long periods where they're up at night or uh, not going to sleep. Uh, a, a sort of a technical issue here is that insomnia is the complaint of insomnia. It's not necessarily short sleep. Short sleep and insomnia are, are two different things. Uh, and there is no consistent interruption of nighttime sleep. So this has been reported. This is reported by, by one anthropologist and gets repeated all the time. We didn't see this. I mean, Certainly some people get up in the middle of the night, uh, and, and you can see in some cases it's obvious that they're tending the fire because you see this burst of light in the middle of the night. Uh, but in general, it's certainly not a group activity where they get up in the middle of the night and they, they sit around and, and chat, which is the way it's been described. And you know, there's this guy, Roger E. Kirch, who wrote a book about 
how Europeans used to sleep in two periods, a first sleep and a second sleep. And I think that may be true uh, because you had night for 16 hours and nothing else to do, so sleep was sort of uh, chaotic. But it, it doesn't exist in, in these uh, three groups. There's a one hour difference between summer and winter duration. And we're now looking to see if this is correlated with a change of, of alertness. Uh, but it, it's not obvious that it is. Uh, and this, has not, this is, again, is something that we've lost. Uh, uh, if you assume that our ancestors slept like these three groups, uh, well, the two groups that have uh, seasonal change, they did have this uh, seasonal change. But the, in, in Western Europe and the United States, to the extent that any uh, summer winter difference has been reported, it's been very small. But in most studies, no difference has been seen. Maximal light exposure occurs in the morning. The sleeping period occupies the coldest part of the night and is occurring during a period of temperature decrease, not just a lowered temperature. Awakening occurs near the low point of temperature, accompanied by vasoconstriction. And uh, temperature is a major regulator of sleep under natural conditions, and we've done away with that. And so if any of you want to look at the original paper, it's on this website. If you don't otherwise have access to it, as are all the angry critiques that have rolled in after that. <laughs> So I, I um, yeah, I guess that's it. So I, uh, this is some of the raw data that's in the supplementary data. But so if you have any questions. Yep. Yeah, I mean, they do uh, sleep together and they, they uh, huddle together uh, in, in the winter. But that's something uh, I can't say we have direct data on that just by asking them. Exposure. Yeah, so this is the question I'm most frequently asked. <laughs> and, and I think that the trouble is, as I understand it now, people here may, may know differently, you know, the Inuit and, and, and uh, indigenous populations in northern latitudes are pretty universally have modified their environment. You know, so they have heat, they have electricity, they're, you know, there are very few, uh, you know, so I would have saved myself a lot of travel costs if I could do this on indigenous populations in the United States, but I don't, I don't think there is a, an American Indian population that doesn't have electricity, and if there was, there would be an out, outcry that, that we need to help these people out. So, you know, so then you, you would sort of need to adjust for the extent to which their environment has been altered. And you know my my issue here. I mean, and I think it'll be interesting to look at different groups because I mean, for an anthropologist, I would think it's interesting to know that people are awake an hour less at one time of the year than, than another. Obviously, this is going to affect all aspects of of their behavior. But but my motivation here was to address this issue of how our sleep has changed, you know, relative to the, the best estimate of what it would be under these conditions and people who have lived under these conditions since birth and are, you know, presumably more similar to our ancestors than any other, uh, other group. But I do think that modifying, you know, so modifying temperature now becomes very, uh, very difficult to do. You know, what, what you would want to do is, uh, you know, study in the clinical research center at UCLA, people living in an environment where this temperature goes up and down like that. But the cost of that is like a couple thousand dollars a day a person. You know, so it's really prohibitive. <clears throat> yeah. So 
How much does the, the temperature regulating sleep account for the summer winter difference? That is, you know, if you have a regression model of, um, in which you're exploring just temperature, can you explain a lot of the seasonal variation? Well, we're trying to get a more parametric, m more data points on that right now. So, uh, you know, obviously we know it's hotter in the summer than, than in the winter. And, and uh, you know, in this, um, you know, we have all this data in here. So you can look at, uh, uh, let's see, I think temperature is in here. <clears throat> yeah, temperature range. So you can see the low point and the high point. And so we do have that data, but rather than trying to make a model on the basis of that, we want to get more data. So, uh, you know, re record uh, continuously in subjects for a long period of time. But that's, that's where we're headed to see if, if we can explain it totally on the basis of temperature, or might there be other factors which would be even more interesting. What we do know is that light doesn't explain it. Not in this data. There was more sleep in females than males, but not significantly more, unless you break out the individual nights, which I think is not kosher. But if you take the mean, the mean of each subject, uh, it seems like it's a small effect, but we're only dealing with like 90, 94 subjects. So uh, I know there's other literature saying that women sleep more than men. It's a small difference. And then, you know, you, we'd also have to account for nursing and, and that, that sort of thing. Yeah. No, but, you know, now I'm working with Gandhi. He stays with them. <laughs> so, you know, my, my technique was uh, both uh, self-serving and uh, uh, easier. Uh, you know, the idea is if I'm there, I might be disturbing their sleep. If I just leave the actor watches, I'm not disturbing it. Uh, plus, I get to sleep in a... Not very nice lodge, but <laughs> I don't have to sleep on the ground. But Gandhi, uh, he, he's this anthropology graduate student who's working with me. He did the, the, the uh, data collection in, uh, uh, in Bolivia. And so we just had our first visit together uh, a month ago, and he stayed for, for almost a week there. And I think he'll be staying for a longer period of time, so he'll get that kind of data. I think they pretty much always have a fire, but it's not a big fire, and they're not, you know, they're not sort of clustered around the fire. That's my understanding. But they, they almost always have a fire because they're worried about animals coming, and um, you know, presumably that, that keeps them away. But you know, again, uh, now that we've seen these relationships, we want to get more data from the, the subjects in terms of their temperature. And uh, you know, when I was I was just there now, and we're putting uh, these these temperature measuring devices uh, outside and also inside their huts. Uh, and then you know, it's like I was we were there, and I'm thinking we ought to ask these people if they're sleeping in the hut. And so as as it turns out, half of them are and half of them aren't. So we'll have that variable now, um, and presumably that changes over the course of the year. But a lot of them are are. You know, sleeping by themselves outside. Yeah. Uh, so I have two questions. One, just following from Brooks' question about sex differences, do you see individual differences in terms of how sort of shifted later or earlier individuals are? I know that it gets discussed a lot in these kind of modern sleep cycles. Is yeah. There night owls and yeah. Things, you know? Not a lot, and and perhaps we should. Uh, I mean, looking at the heterogeneity, you mean uh, you need a bigger control group and. Uh, but I think that's very interesting. I mean, again, in, in, in modern society, uh, you know, we have larks and owls is, is the conventional terminology. And uh, I think the environment might force less variability in this. You know, if, if uh, you know, uh, my wife stays up to watch movies at TV at four in the morning, if it was freezing cold, I don't think she would do that. <laughs> um, so... Uh, I mean, I, th I think it's, it's, it's a very interesting question. Um, be hard. You, uh, um, 
it's not so easy to quantify in our environment either. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult, it's a very interesting question. It's a difficult uh, question to, to address. But, but certainly that, that might be a factor. And again, this insomnia thing is a huge effect. And, and let me just put in my, my commercial here, which is a, a, a big motivation for my doing these studies. The idea that people sleep less than, than we used to less than we used to 20 years ago, uh, and that this is causing the obesity epidemic is, is wrong, I think. Uh, but but the, um, the public health significance is that this is very much the narrative that's used to sell sleeping pills. And the use of sleeping pills has uh, been increasing exponentially. It's increased, it's more than doubled in the last 10 years, and it's, it, it's doubled in the 10 years before that. The United States and New Zealand are the only countries in the world, as I understand it, that allow direct-to-consumer advertising of uh, prescription medications. And if you, know, if you watch TV after 11 p.m., uh, all the ads are for sleeping pills. And, and the implication is that you're doing something that, that improves your health. But in fact, there have now been about 20 epidemiological studies that show a dose-dependent reduction in lifespan uh, with sleeping pill use. This is benzodiazepines. Uh, whereas untreated insomnia is not associated with a shortened lifespan at all, there's some suggestion that it might actually uh, be associated with, with, with a longer lifespan. Uh, I'm not saying insomnia is good for you. I know people are miserable. but. Uh, Insomnia is very rare in these populations, so there may be some uh, temperature manipulation that, that would be helpful, but uh, sleeping pills are, are uh, really kind of a scam. They, they were initially approved for short-term use, for two-week use, and I have no argument with people using for two weeks if they've you know, had a relative die or something like that, or, or even uh, traveling and they need to adjust. The, the trouble is short-term use leads to long-term use. And there is no study that I am aware of that shows any health benefit from chronic use of sleeping pills, not a one. And there are on the order of 20 studies showing shortened lifespan with, with sleeping pill use. And that's, you know, that's why this study has attracted a lot of attention, a lot of anger. you a little bit on, on one thing you said, which is, um, you know, in that sort of blame Thomas Edison um, narrative, um, you, you were taking issue with that because you were showing, well, um, in fact, you know, light exposure is going down midday, um, uh, and uh, presumably that's because people are resting in the shade, as you pointed out. My concern is that before we make too much of that, um, being outdoors in the shade is not the same as being indoors. Right? Oh, no. No, I'm not saying that that is, is the cause of anything. I'm just saying it's interesting that there's this change. And I should also say, I thought you were headed in another direction, so I had my reply prepared. But since you didn't ask the question, I'll answer it anyway. And, and uh, after we published this, uh, this, this guy, Sean Youngstead, did a study looking at uh, uh, sleep times reported over the last 50 years. That's sort of the era in which we've had EEG recording, and that's the gold standard. And he looked through the control groups of all the published studies and found that there's no difference over this, over this period. So, I mean, you could argue that, uh, you know, sleep time used to be much higher in the 1900s, uh, in the early 1900s. And, uh, you know, it, it, it did decrease, but uh, it was actually much higher than it is now, and we, we have reduced our sleep. But uh, at least over the period where this, this kind of meme has, has proliferated that we don't, we don't sleep as much as we used to, uh, certainly over the period where there's been the internet and TV usage, uh, there's been no change in human sleep. This one? Yep. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested in this as a, whether 
whether it's representing something that's like an evolved response to wake somebody up or if it is truly just a response to the environmental conditions. So do you have any data on like your subjective experience of it being cold versus just they wake up and are feeling No, no. I mean, we got, we, we sort of got this data after we had left. You know, we, we analyzed data. Um, so, you know, I, I, we have asked them in a general way, and they, you know, they, they say that. You know, how consistent is that? I think we need to, uh, as you're suggesting, kind of uh, debrief them. I mean, the, the the trouble is, one of my motivations for not doing this well was laziness, and the other and the other was not interfering. You know, if you keep drawing attention to all these things, and you know, your 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 you know the the uncertainty principle is coming in, and you might be affecting things. But I think that's an interesting question, whether they have the sensation. I just know introspectively that I've had the sensation waking up that way. Uh, but I certainly don't on, on a normal day. But of course, I'm in a heated house. Uh, but I have had it in, in the Sierras. On the same topic, is a viable alternative interpretation here that you wake up and your hands are under the blanket and fairly warm, and then you wake up and so you take your hands out of the blanket and then they're exposed to the cold air. The, the hand temperature drops because you wake up, not, not the reverse. Sure. I mean, it's occurring. Uh, this, this is a sort of a group average we're seeing from all the subjects. So, you know, this is a time of awakening. And uh, it, it's not preceding awakening. So it's, you know, what this indicates is that they weren't vasoconstricted in the cold prior to that, because then you wouldn't get a vasoconstriction. But I'm not saying that the vasoconstriction is what wakes them up. I'm saying it happens when they wake up, even in the summer, which is surprising to me. I mean, par par part of the idea here is there have been a number of studies using the same techniques, the, these I buttons, that show that in order to go to sleep, we dump temperature. So most of us, and presumably if we had, re, you know, if, if they were behaving in the same way, you would have get, gotten an increase in temperature at sleep onset, an increase in hand temperature, which is a way of dissipating heat, because we do know that your body temperature goes down at night. And the way it goes down is you dissipate temperature. And there's some data that people with insomnia don't seem to do this. And you know, again, it's, it's, it's the temperature that seems to be intimately involved. And I completely agree. It, it's, uh, it, it's not that the vasoconstriction wakes them up, but it is that they, they vasoconstrict about the time they wake up. But they don't vasodilate when they go to sleep. And this is something that's been consistently observed in, in, you know, in Europe and the United States. So it's a, it's a uh, sort of a reversed pattern. Yeah. Have any of you had any uh, data on, so the, I forget which populations it was, but when they're waking up significantly before sunrise. Right. Um, do you have any sort of ambient noise data or anything else? Because of course they're, you know, they're living in environments where birds are waking up and monkeys and all sorts of other stuff that could be making noise. Or do you, I mean, just, yeah, so one of my colleagues, Niels Rottenberg, who studies birds, he studies sleep in birds, he's the world sleep bird expert. So early on in, in doing this, he, he said, well, it's the birds that are waking him up. Uh, and so we did uh, do a digital recording of sound for four days uh, during one of these studies, and we didn't, we didn't see anything. There wasn't sort of loud bird noise. There might be some bird noise. We also asked the people, which I think is actually probably a more potent technique, you know, what wakes you up? And uh, they don't say it's noise. They just wake up. Uh, but again, this is something that, that could be explored further. Of course, however they wake up, uh, you know, if they were awakened earlier, you would expect the next day's sleep to, to be increased, and that there should be some relationship. And, and you know, they're living uh, in balance here, I think, in terms of uh, sleep time. But, you know, I guess that could be further investigated. Um, you've chosen to focus on mid adulthood. You said 30 to 55. Um, do you have any um, thoughts about adolescence or older ages? Um, 
Change yeah, so what has been reported uh, in our culture is that sleep time is decreases with age, although between 20 and 55, it's flat. Uh, and in fact, it can be flat beyond that. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't decrease unless you have Alzheimer's or something like that. We have actually one of the subjects that we didn't use was 92 years old and the Chimana, she had one of the higher amounts of sleep that we saw. So, um, so you know, my, my goal was to make the sort of comparison I made rather than see if this well-established relationship is present there. We did plot the data out by age and saw a hint of a decrease with age, but there are not enough subjects, and I would like to, in the future, add some uh, younger subjects. Because again, maybe uh, this is a, a luxury that we have uh, to have high amounts of adolescent sleep, um, but I, I suspect we would see it. I mean, I think that uh, a major part of the reason that adolescents and young animals sleep. I mean, usually it's attributed to brain maturation, which is occurring and that they are, you know, they need sleep for the brain to mature. But a, another benefit of sleeping is that you use less energy. Your body's energy consumption goes way down. And if, if your main uh, uh, evolutionary function in life is to grow up, you want to devote as much energy to that as possible. So it sort of makes some adaptive sense that, uh, you know, that, that kids would sleep a lot just so that they can grow their bones and, and their body. And uh, I, was, I was living in Northridge during the North, Northridge earthquake. I actually had to wake my kids up. <laughs> so, you know, it's like the, the, the role of kids is to be unconscious uh, and, and the, the role of uh, adults is to, is to alert and, and uh, tell them they're in danger. Basically, what I'm asking is, like, to what degree is the time of wake being determined by, like, the local culture, or the time of wake? Well, this, this group is an hour from anything. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not close to the city, and sometimes it's completely cut off. In fact, the first time we went there, you know, nobody had been to this village for several months. Um, so, uh, you know, the... The, the, the reason, so, so we worked in this place called De Nui, and uh, it was uh, selected because the translator that we're working with, who is also San, but lives in the city, um, basically offered us the choice, do you want to work with the people in the city who are very convenient to work with, but are mostly alcoholics? Or do you want to work with the, the, the group in, in Danui who are hunter, are, you know, d do hunt and gather and, uh, you know, don't have much contact? So that's what I, I, I did, obviously. There are several, I mean, I think there are about 40 encampments. But to my knowledge, this is, is, is the one that's most accessible and least integrated with the uh, the general economy, that's why we chose them. So we've gone back to this group several times. It's just that one between well, they have actually, the, the, the village is broken into two halves that are, you know, a 10 minute walk from each other, but they, you know, it's sort of considered, you know, yeah. one, I mean, I think it would be interesting to look at that, but, but for, the, for the main variables I'm interested in, the idea was, uh, to, to, you know, study these groups that are widely separated, one in East Africa, one in West Africa, and one kind of at the end of human migration in, in South America, and they're, they're fairly similar. I, I'm sure there would be subtle differences, and, you know, as we close in on sort of the relationship to temperature and other things, we might want to look at these, uh, these groups, but there, there are other groups, but each one has its own kind of 
situation, and, and this one has seemed to be, uh, at least in the uh, San group, the, the most isolated. The, I should say, actually, this more addresses your question. In, in the Chimani, a whole bunch of different groups were studied. So, so Gandhi was going from one to another. They're a little bit more market integrated, but, but uh, he, he studied, um, I think, at least 10 different groups of 10 people. So that's the data that you saw plotted in, in, in the bar graph, sleep as a function of time of year. So we do have that. And you know, the, the question is, if you want to make uh, comparisons, you've got to make sure it's consistent. You've got to go back, and, and perhaps we'll be able to do that. No, no, no. I, I remember many years ago when you came and spoke to us about uh, sleep across mammals. Um, uh, if I remember correctly, you, you said that domestic dogs um, have this enormously long sleep duration if people are not around. So hmm. they sleep alone, they sleep. Um, and uh, a lot of small scale societies have dogs. Um, they aren't pets, they're, you know, they, they, they're functional animals. And I wonder if you've entertained the possibility of, of measuring sleep in the dogs, because um, that will tell you in part how much temperature is driving things. Right? Um, yeah, that's actually a very interesting thought that hadn't, hadn't occurred to me. And I have a lot of experience studying sleep in dogs, because we have a colony of narcoleptic dogs. So we've not only done EEG recording, but neuronal activity recording. That's, that's sort of my day job, you know? <laughs> So I, I, I've done a lot. This, this is a very good idea because they, you know, the trouble is the kind of measurements you would want would be invasive, but you might be able to put the act. Actually, we've put actor watches on the neck uh, of, you know, with, you know, like a necklace. That's a great idea. So, you know, part of what I hear all the time is people look at their dog and the dog sleeps all the time. It sleeps during the day, it sleeps at night, it's awake at night. It's, you know, you describe that as polycyclic and, you know, Rats and mice do that, of course, all at uh, regulated temperatures, but you know, in the lab. And uh, that's another claim that's often made. Well, humans are, are meant to be polycyclic, and it, you know, it's just because we have electric light and you know, we, we have jobs that we have to do our sleep in one epoch, and it really be much uh, healthier. So, so the, the article that you read critiquing our article, that, that seemed to be his main obsession, that everybody knows we're polycyclic. Well, in fact, primates are not polycyclic. Cats and dogs, lots of literature they are. Primates are not, and, and these people are not. So uh, it would be very interesting. And, and so a lot of our information on animals being polycyclic is based on animals living with us in an environment that doesn't, doesn't have, <laughs> so, you know, and, and actually where I live, we hear coyotes, and, you know, there, there's another kind of sleep. So there's nocturnal, diurnal, and there's something called crepuscular, meaning active at dawn and dusk. And uh, uh, coyotes are active at dawn and dusk, and we hear them. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I doubt whether they would be that way if they were in a lab somewhere on a 12-12 cycle. So, that's a great idea. Anybody else has another question? So, so uh, I mean, you, you sort of referenced this in passing, in, in part to um, in the context of uh, the representative from the sleep member company. Um, I, I think, I mean, there's a there's a there's an interesting empirical question. It's a developmental question in part, but not entirely which is what accounts for the ease of sleep as a function of substrate. So I worked for many years in Indonesia and was very impressed by people's ability to sleep on concrete, right, for example, right, and to, to sleep on buses in which the temperature was, you know, 103 degrees and 100% humidity and it's bouncing along a poorly maintained road, right? People are fast asleep. That's something that's very, very difficult for typical American to do, and hence this large industry of selling us you know, fancy substrates. Um, my daughter, who moved to Indonesia at age nine, by age 10 could sleep on concrete. Hmm. Um, so I'm curious whether you know, you've considered 
how much just like we have a built environment with not just electric lights and thermostats, but clocks, um, we also have a built environment that's really different in a lot of ways with regard to the surfaces on which people sleep. Um, and I'm wondering if you're entertaining research directions that would explore that. Yeah, well, I'm interested. Um, <laughs> a few years ago, I, was, I got a call from someone who uh, works for this company called Hostins, and they make beds out of horsehair, and they wanted me to speak at their meeting, and they invited me they, they, uh, downtown where they had a showroom, and they, you know, they show me this bed, and uh, yeah, I see there's, there's, no, uh, there's no price tags on any of these. And I said, well, how much, how much is this bed? He said, $35,000. <laughs> so I said, well, you know, give me the bed, and I'll see. But, but you know, so, I mean, if you're desperate, if, if you can't sleep, you'll, you, you know, I'm sure there are lots of people in Los Angeles that can spring for $35,000 for a bed. Uh, but I do think uh, people get, get used to it. And, uh, you know, I once got asked if, you know, if sleep surface is the main cause of insomnia. I said, you know, not if you're not sleeping on a bed of nails, you know. It's, uh, um, so, I, I mean, there have been studies. And you know, so they wanted me to do a study. It to, because they said, you know, you, you wake up in ex the exact position you went to sleep. Well, we know that's not good because if this is what happens with people with spinal cord injuries, if, if, if they're allowed to lay in one position for, for more than a few hours, they get bed sores, which, you know, can ultimately be lethal in a, in a person who's already sick. So there is this program you're supposed to move that's part of healthy sleep. And uh, I mean, it is amazing. The you know they're sleeping on the ground, and although I, <laughs> there's one guy who managed to get a mattress into his hut, uh, I don't think it would be very practical because they get infested with bugs. And actually, for that matter too, you know, I would imagine they have bugs crawling over them. And you know, with all this, they're sleeping a normal amount. We did do a, a preliminary. There's a, a test for alertness, um, and we're going to be doing more of this. But they seem quite alert, you know, there isn't, they're not, I mean, the, the behavioral definition, you know, the, the operational definition of being sleepy is that you go to sleep quickly, and, and there's something called the multiple sleep latency test, which is basically, you tell someone to lay down and see how long it takes them to go, get to sleep. Um, the absence of napping suggests that that's not uh, happening, and, you know, you can see they're not active at midday, they're sitting around, but they're not, they're not sleeping. So, you know, I think there are a lot of aspects like this that, that can be uh, studied. Well, you only, you, I mean, I guess anyone can be anxious about something and, you know, you, if you have a, a big event the next day, I think most of us have kind of disturbed sleep. Um, but uh, the thing about insomnia is it's a complaint. It's not defined by how long you sleep. And, and you know, I get emails all the time from people with insomnia and I believe they're miserable. If you're trying to get to sleep and you can't get to sleep, and uh, there's, they're also sort of agitated during the day. You would think people who complain of insomnia would be sleepy during the day, but they're not. I mean, that's the problem is that they're not sleepy ever. Um, they're, just, they're just active all the time. But, um, you know, I think, so, so I, it's, it's a real issue, uh, but I also think some of the incidents of, of insomnia may be a function of people worrying about insomnia, you know? If, if, you, if you think that if you sleep less than seven hours, and that actually, that's another whole story I can get into, but if you sleep less than seven hours, you're gonna have a shortened lifespan, and you do sleep less than seven hours, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna keep you awake at night, you know? Just, just the, the idea that you're not sleeping adequately and that it's, it's uh, dangerous, in fact, Here's, here's another statistic. So uh, there have been three huge studies, four huge studies, of 
sleep duration and longevity in humans. Uh, one study was done, the first one was done by this guy Dan Kripke in San Diego, uh, polled a million people and then checked five years later to see who had died among that group. And so you can do these huge epidemiological studies. You're not measuring sleep, but we know that what people say is their sleep duration more or less reflects their actual sleep duration. So, you know, the, certainly when you're average over this huge population, you, you can have a lot of confidence in the results. So the optimal sleep duration, perceived sleep duration, is about seven hours. And the, you know, more or less than that, uh, lifespan is shorter. But, but the surprising thing is that the effect of sleeping more than seven hours shortens your lifespan more than the effect of sleeping less than seven hours. So it's actually people who sleep nine and ten hours, now, there may be many explanations for that. But combined with the data on sleeping pill use, it, it paints a picture that, you know, being, being asleep a long time beyond some optimal amount is not really good for you. And I think if you view it in a wider context, I think it's pretty well accepted and prospective studies show that if you sit around all day and don't do any exercise, your, your lifespan will be shorter than if you do some regular aerobic exercise several times a day that's been shown in, in many studies. And to at the same time think that the longer you're asleep, the better it is for you is, is a, a contradiction, you know, some of the, the same problems of immobility and uh, blood flow and uh, metabolism uh, might, might apply, and indeed the evidence suggests that. So it's a complicated business, and I do think, you know, there are many sleep researchers who have insomnia, not me, but, <laughs> you know, I, I, I do believe that uh, people are miserable if they have insomnia. The trouble is, the, the best treatment for that is behavioral. No caffeine, no alcohol, get up at a regular time. You can't really tell people to go to sleep at a regular time because people with insomnia already can't go to sleep at the time they're choosing, but they can wake up at the, at the sleep time they're choosing and also no napping. And this, this cures most people with insomnia, whereas chronic sleeping pill use doesn't actually increase sleep time uh, after, after a couple of weeks, uh, sleep time is maybe 10, 15 minutes more. It's not, it's not greatly increased. So, you know, I think that, that's sort of the big picture here, that uh, obsessing about uh, sleep duration, when we can't really control it, we can shorten it, but we can't lengthen it, but we can prevent insomnia, we can present, prevent this irregularity by what's commonly called sleep hygiene, and it's just sort of standard advice. You know, I, th I think uh, it's good advice. Okay.